As you know, I'm not the regular preacher here. Jeff Chitwood is our preacher. And uh, next week, I believe, Darren, are you preaching next week or is Carrie preaching next week? Carrie's preaching next week. Carrie's here this morning. And the following week, then Darren is going to preach. So uh, all three of us are going to get a chance to bring the word to you in Jeff's absence. He's gone two weeks to this mission trip in Africa. And then when he gets back, he's doing a revival in Illinois. And uh, somebody was here this morning in the first service saying, he's going to be at my church in two weeks. So... Anyway, I don't know why they came this morning, knowing that Jeff wasn't going to be here. No, no, anyway. Jeff has been in in this followership series. And, uh, you know, you've seen the slide. It's been behind all of our uh, songs this morning. That man who's on the road, and he's headed more towards the cross. Are you moving toward the goal? Or are you standing still? The, The title of the message this morning is, What Now? That's the question, what now? What now? After this followership series, what now? What do we do? What's next? If you want to turn in your Bibles, in the pew Bibles in front of you, Matthew 28 is where we're going to start. We're going to be in several scriptures this morning. But my basic theme is, what does it mean to be a a disciple? And what does it mean to make disciples? What now? Matthew 28, verse 18. Maybe you've got this passage memorized. Jesus came and said to them, the them is the disciples, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus said in in verse 18, All authority in heaven. Now, he didn't need to say that because it's understood. All authority was his. But just so there's no question, he tells the disciples, just so you know, all authority, it's mine. We see lots of times in the scriptures, Jesus, everything he says should have been taken to pay attention to. But there were even times in scripture when Jesus would say, truly, truly. Or the old King James, he'd say, verily, verily. We have said recently that the word amen perhaps not used as much in church circles today. And so one of the songs we sing regularly here is, yeah, the song starts with, yeah, yeah, yeah. That could be said the same way. Or the the, uh, Greek word is amen, amen. Truly, truly, verily, verily. Amen, amen, yeah, yeah. And that's what Jesus is saying here, all authority. So now hear this, his last words. Pay attention. Move a little closer. Last words in Matthew's Gospels are this. Go. Or as the imperative Greek explains, as you're going, make disciples. There's the word. The last words of people is always sometimes important. You could do a study of that. What are the last words that people say? There's a story about a guy that was on his deathbed in the hospital. Of course, everybody was leaning a little closer and he turned to his wife. His whole family was there around him. And he turned to his wife and he said, you know, honey, When my first business went under, you were right there with me. And later when the plant burned down and all of us were out of work and we had to build back up again, you were right there with me. And then later when we had made some investments and, you know, they turned sour and we had to to file for bankruptcy, you were right there. Honey, you're bad luck. No, not exactly. (laughs) Jesus' last words are, go and make disciples, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Notice he didn't say, go fill your churches. Start churches everywhere and fill your churches with people in the seats. People who come to worship. Make members. Draw a crowd, see how many people you can get, and then see if you can get more than people down the street are getting. And then you can feel good about yourself because we had X number of people in our services. Woohoo! It's not what it's about, folks. Did you hear Jesus' words? Make disciples, followers, people who are sold out, who are radical in their belief and their followership. You know, we, we often talk about radical Muslims. You know, I don't think they are radical Muslims. 
I think they're just Muslims who've read their book. And they know what their book says. And their book says, kill the infidel. Wipe them out. You can call that radical if you want. But I don't think that's radical. I think that's just applying the book. And those who aren't doing what they're doing, they're the watered down. They're the liberals. They're the people who either don't know or don't care what their book says. Now, Christianity doesn't call us to go out and start killing people who don't agree with us. But could anybody call us radicals? Because we're sold out, 100% lock, stock, and barrel followers of Jesus Christ. Could they say, my goodness, that anchor Christian church, they've got some real radicals. That's, that may be what they call us if we really follow. And if, if you're co- uncomfortable so far, hold on, because it gets worse. Promise. As they were standing there, the disciples, seeing Jesus lifted into heaven, we might say, what next? Well, the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 6, says, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, this is the disciples asking Jesus, Lord, will will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. There's that word again. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, and they said, this is Robert's paraphrase, why are you still standing here? What are you doing? He said, go. Hello? Go. Go. And what do you do as you go? First, he gave you instructions. Go back to Jerusalem. Wait for power. And after you get power, go. Make disciples. Baptize. Teach. Baptize. Teach. Baptize. Teach. Not make members. Not draw crowds. Not do all those other things. Make disciples. So two points under what now? Number one, be a disciple. And the question to us, to me, this morning is, how are we on this disciple process? What kind of a disciple am I? Am I one of those radical disciples? Ephesians 4, verse 11. And he gave to the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for the building up of the body of Christ. Why did God equip those people? To draw a crowd? To get people to come? To say, look at us, how many people we're gathering. Woo, look at us. No, it was to build up the body of Christ. Put in real simple terms, grow up. Some of us, and I'm speaking about myself, should be further down the road than we are. We've been at this thing called Christianity a long time. Grow up. Be mature. Don't be a childish Be childlike in our faith, but childish? Sorry, it has no place. Here in in Ephesians 4, for the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood. We might say also womanhood in the body of Christ to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up. There it is again. Those aren't just my words saying to the body of Christ, grow up. Paul said it to the Ephesians and by implication to us as well in the 21st century. What does he say? Grow up. Grow up. From whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body, here it is again, grow so that it builds itself up in love. Be equipped. Be mature. Stop being children. Grow up. Grow in love. Just several of the ideas pulled out of that passage in Ephesians 4. Can I read them to you again? Be equipped. Be mature. Stop being children. Grow up. Grow in love. 
there was in that passage, there was those, those human things of man, the craftiness, the cunningness, the deceitful schemes. Would you know them in Christian circles if they came up? I was listening to a, a preacher uh, last week. He was talking about, you know how it was one time for us to be at the cool table? Maybe in junior high, you know, there was that one table where all the cool people were at. We couldn't wait to be at the cool table. All the cool, maybe it was the, the cheerleaders or the, you know, the chess team. <laughs> maybe it was the members of the band. Yeah. It wasn't at my school either. But there was a cool table, and everybody aspired to be at the cool table. And at one time, maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago, in Christianity and Christian circles, we were at the cool table. It was cool to be a Christian. To be a member of a church, well, that was a status thing. And so you wanted to be a part of a church. You moved to a new community. You wanted people to know you. You wanted to network you know, in the community. So you'd go to church, and you'd be a part of that church. To be at the cool table. But folks, you know what I think is happening in our culture? The church, or being a part of the body of Christ, is ceasing to be less and less the cool table. They don't come to us to find out what we think. They don't come to us unless they want to mock us and they want to call us antiquated and how old-fashioned we are and how we don't fit in. Because the truth of the gospel in our culture evermore is not the part of the cool table anymore. And so some people, to be at the cool table, have said, well, we'll, we'll let our doctrine slide just a little bit and, and, and we'll move the boundary just a little bit so we fit in. Would you know a false doctrine if you were confronted with it? Do you know the truth so well that if somebody said to you, I believe this, you would say, nah, I'm sorry, that doesn't square with Scripture. Some of us should. There's a movie right now out in the theaters. I read the book when it came out first in uh, 2010. The name of the book was The Shack. Anybody seen the movie? I love the book. The part of the book where um, the person, the main character, I forget the name of the main character right now. Some of you could help me out, but maybe you couldn't. Um, The main character, I don't know if you know the premise of the book, but this guy lost his daughter. She was abducted. They were on a camp out. She was abducted. And she was taken to a shack and she was tortured and then later killed. And this guy is so angry and so bitter and so confused about why, how, how an all-caring, righteous, moral God wouldn't do something, if he could, which he can, why he didn't step in and do something about it. And in one part of the book, he gets an opportunity to stand in the, in the dock, to put God on trial and to rail against God. And he finds himself not able to. Because he knows that's futile. I love that part of the book. But another part of the book, if you've not read the book, and I don't know about about the movie, I've not seen the movie. And I probably won't. Not saying you shouldn't. Not saying if you love it. But I was listening to a podcast this last week. Uh, Chris Brooks on Moody Radio was interviewing people who had seen the movie and what they thought about it. And some of these people, Bible-believing Christians, said, I really love the movie because of this, 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 and this. And Chris Brooks says, what about the universalism that's portrayed in the book and that's in the movie? Do you know what universalism is? Universalism, as it's known, says everybody's going to heaven. It doesn't matter what stripe you are, what kind of church you go to, whether you're a Buddhist, Muslim, Uh, It doesn't matter what book you read, what book you know. God just says, oh, come on, everybody. It's all right. Whatever you've done, wherever you've been. If you're in Christ, if you're not in Christ, it doesn't matter. I just love you all and want all of you to be on the road to me because all roads lead to me, you know, essentially. Come on, it's okay. Do you recognize that as universalism? And do you know that that's a heresy? Would you recognize it if you came in contact with it? Would you know that, well, that's really not what the book says? My mom used to work at a bank. She told me that when she was at the bank, they never let the tellers handle counterfeit bills. 
If they found a counterfeit bill, they'd pull it out of circulation immediately. One, so that they wouldn't you know, accidentally pass it off to somebody else, because heaven forbid that a bank teller gives somebody a bill that's not any good. But she said what they wanted them to know, so if there was a counterfeit bill in the bank somewhere, the tellers could not handle it. The reason was because they didn't ever want a, a bank teller to know what a counterfeit bill felt like. They always wanted them to know what a, a, a true bill looked like and felt like and smelled like and looked like through the light. They didn't let him hold the counterfeit. Do you so know the truth that when counterfeit comes, you say, hey, that's not true. That's false. Because the devil is, is a schemer. Cunningness, craftiness, deceitful schemes, that's what Paul warned the Ephesians of. Hebrews 5, 11 says this, About this we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers. Now, not necessarily that you have the gift of teaching, that you should be standing up in a class, but you should be teachers. You need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he's a child, spiritually speaking. But solid food is for, here's the word again, mature. For those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practices to distinguish good from evil. How are you on your journey to be a disciple? Are you moving forward? Chuck Swindoll several years ago, 30 years ago, maybe 40 years ago, wrote a book called Three Steps Forward, Two Steps Back. I think that's okay progress. If you go three steps forward and then fall back two steps, you know what the most important part of that process is? Going forward. Are you going forward in your love and your knowledge and your discipleship? Are you going forward? About 40 years ago, Richard Foster wrote a book about the Christian disciplines. We don't practice the Christian disciplines anymore. Anybody know that we're in Lenten season right now? The Lenten season? Anybody know about Lent? Other than, well, we usually give up something for Lent. Lent is also the time, it's, it's 40 weeks. I'm sorry, seven weeks, 40 days before Easter. And because Easter moves every year in our calendar in Western uh, Christianity, so does Lent. And Fat Tuesday is the Tuesday before Ash Wednesday, where in some churches they put a mark of ashes. They put a, a cross on your forehead. And that marks the beginning of Lent season. And in Lent, people are in tune with the Christian disciplines, or they used to be. Not so much anymore. We've gotten out of that habit. I think it's probably a good habit. Do you know what the Christian disciplines are? W- would you recognize them if I read them to you? The inward disciplines are meditation, prayer, fasting, study. In some Christian circles, they're using these seven weeks to be introspective about what God may be saying to me as we anticipate the celebration and the resurrection on Easter Sunday morning. Especially that third one, fasting. What do we know about fasting in Protestant circles? in independent Christian church circles. What do you know about fasting? Oh, we might know, you know, from now till Easter, I'm going to give up chocolate. From now till Easter, I'm going to give up strychnine poison. (laughs) It's pretty easy, because I don't usually drink strychnine, but, you know, from now to Easter, I'm not going to drink any. I knew a pastor one time who said, from now till Easter, I'm going to separate myself, and I'm telling everybody, I'm, I'm, unhooking myself from all social media. Yikes, talk about fasting. But really, the question is, as we think about fasting, when is the last time we told ourselves no about anything? As you can tell from my girth, I don't usually tell myself no about anything. Well, I do, but it doesn't look like it. Fasting. And if you read the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Jesus didn't say, if you fast, go back and check it out and see if I'm telling you right or wrong. Matthew 5, 6, or 7. I think it's in Matthew 6. Go back and check it out this afternoon. See if I'm wrong. If Jesus didn't say, when you fast, not if, 
when you fast. Don't make yourself look pitiful. So people go, oh, he's so spiritual, he's fasting. He said, when you fast, do this, do this, do this. An outward discipleship, an outward discipline of simplicity, solitude, submission, service. When is the last time we did anything for somebody else because there wasn't anything in it for us? Submission, that's a dirty word. Solitude. When was the last time you turned everything off and were just quiet? Maybe out in the woods, maybe in your prayer closet if you've got one. Or you decided that you were just going to live simply. Those are the outward disciplines. The corporate disciplines, confession, worship, guidance, celebration. The worship one we probably got. What about confession? When was the last time you confessed your sins one to another, the scriptures tell us? When was the last time you had somebody hold you accountable, ask you the hard questions? Are you reading your Bible? Are you relating well with your family, your wife, your kids? Are you treating your parents well? Are you honoring your mother and your father? Are you being honest in all your business dealings? When was the last time we gave somebody permission to ask us those questions? And then if there was something we needed to confess, we felt comfortable to confess it to someone else. Like I said, if it's making you uncomfortable, I didn't necessarily promise that you wouldn't be uncomfortable. And I'm not just asking you those questions, I'm asking myself these questions as well. From 1 Peter 2, Peter says, Put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may, here's that word again, grow up into salvation. Later in the passage, verse 5, it says, you are being built up as a spiritual house. That's being a disciple. How are you? As, you've, as, as I've spoken this morning and, and called to, to mind some of those things, how are we? Are we moving forward? Are you closer in your journey than you were last week, last month? Last year, can you say, yeah, I'm moving forward. I'm making some progress. Oh, I I may be going three steps and then back two and then three steps, but I'm moving forward. I'm going. Or are we like the disciples saying, well, he went that way. You suppose he's coming back anytime soon? Are we moving forward? The angel says, hey, psst, move. He said, go, go. Be a disciple and also make disciples. If you've not turned to any other passage, would you you please grab a Bible somewhere, on your phone, on your tablet, in the uh, pew, in the rack in front of the chair in in front of you? Would you please take a Bible, and would you please turn to Mark 3? Matthew is the first gospel there in that pocket New Testament. The second gospel is the gospel of Mark, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. If you haven't turned to anything else, if, if you don't remember anything else, I want you to remember this as, you, as we go this morning. And I'm just almost done. Mark chapter 3. In verse 14, we read of Jesus, according to Mark's gospel, appointing the twelve. In the ESV it says, And he appointed twelve, parenthetically, whom he also named apostles, so that they might... Do you see what it says? Not send them out. Not make them super apostles. Not carry on the work. Not make disciples. What did Jesus call them to do? To be with Him. Oh, the other work comes, and of course, Jesus, the master teacher, knew he needed to train someone because he wasn't going to be here forever. He needed to get these things in place. He was the great leader. He was, you know, giving that work out to someone else. He was, you know, passing it on. He was going to hold somebody else accountable. He wanted, there's work to be done. We wouldn't be standing here if they hadn't done the work that he gave them to do. All of that is important. But Jesus, because of his humanity, chose 12 to be with him. Not just to send them out, not just to preach, not just to do the work, because he couldn't do it because he was going back to be with the Father. He chose them to be with him. Who's in your group? Who's in your group? If you're a disciple, who's in your group? 
2 Timothy 2 says, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus and what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust a faithful men who will be able to teach others also. There's the sending out. There's the I need to, to draw some people around me as a disciple. I need to make disciples. I need to have somebody pouring their faith into my life. I need to be pouring out my faith into other people's lives. I, we live in community. That was God's idea, not some man's idea for us to be in community. But I need somebody to be with me, just as Jesus did, and so do you. Who's with you? Who's your group? Who's in your small group? Discipleship happens best in circles, not in rows. The rows are a great idea. Teaching happens in rows. I'll, I'll grant that. Teaching happens in rows. Every Sunday across this land, thousands of people, millions of people are gathered in rows, and teaching happens, and they're getting the word. But discipleship happens in circles, not in rows. My question to us, who do you know well enough that they would be able to, to you, you would be able to list three things on their prayer list. I know person X, and person X on their prayer list is this, this, and this. How many people do you know like that? And how many people know you like that? How many people say, for Robert, I know what's on his, on his prayer list right this week? Because he shared it with me the last time we were together. Robert's praying about this, Robert's praying about this, and Robert's praying about this. Who's on your list? 2 Timothy 1, verse 13. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you've heard from me and the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Discipleship happens best in circles, not in rows. So the last thing I have for us this morning is a word from Mike Warnke, a Christian speaker several years ago. And I hesitate to use this story because, you know, at, at the conclusion of his ministry, there were some things that Mike Warnke had said in public that may or may not have been true, and I'm not sure if this story is true. So he told it as a true story. I'm going to tell it to you as it might have happened. It illustrates a good point. Mike Warnke was a medic in the Marine Corps in Vietnam. He thought that'd be pretty easy duty. What he didn't know was that as a part of this unit, he had to carry not only his stuff, the medical stuff, but he also had to carry stuff for the unit. The unit he was with happened to be an artillery unit. So he had to carry the base for a gun, which was a big heavy plate of steel that when you know, they were going to use it, they'd plop it down, they'd put the rest of the gun on top of it, and it was the base for this gun as they were using it. Big, heavy plate of steel on his back. He said it was really heavy. And he said the place that they were marching in this one particular day was over lots of places where napalm had burned out everything. So they're walking through all this ash, burned out stuff. And he said that they're, they're headed to the, the hill, you know, top of the hill where they're going to they're make camp for the night. But they're not even there yet. They can see it off in the distance. They know where they're going. They're headed to it. But it's a long, hot day. Humidity is, you know astronomically high. It always feels like it's raining, but it's not. Sun bearing down on them. He said, they came to this place that the napalm had not reached, this little valley. And it was lush and green, and there was a little bit of water running through it. Mike says, in the story, he says, he thought, you know what? I'm going to linger here for just a little bit. I'm going to take my shoes off. I'm going to put them in that water, wipe off some of the grime on my feet. And so he did. He sat down, and as soon as he sat down, other guys in his unit said, you're an idiot. You're never going to put those, get your shoes and your boots back on if you do that. Don't do that. That's stupid. Don't do that. And he thought about it for a second. He, he says, no, I'm going to do it. So he sat down, and he put, took off his pack, and he took off his shoes, and he took off his socks, and he put them in the water. And, oh, that felt good. And guys were walking by him saying, Warnke, don't do that. Come on, come, stay with us. Let's go. And finally, everybody passed in his unit. He was getting ready to, to get ready to go, and then the thought hit him. If somebody was going to be ambushed, where would they ambush him? And if somebody was going to be taken out, nobody in the unit would even know he, had, he was dead until it was too late. Where would they do it? Right here. It was then he realized, I need those guys around me. Oops, I'm in a bad spot. And he grabbed his stuff quickly and went up and joined his group. Are you by yourself? Are you a lone ranger? 
Are you doing this thing with enough people around you to hold you accountable, to keep you moving forward? We're not going to sing a song this morning to close this, this service. Not at this point. There'll be a song later. Right now what I want you to do is bow your heads. In front of you are one of these connect cards. And maybe God is putting it on your heart. You're saying, you know what, I need to be in a small group. And maybe you don't need to be in a small group. Somebody else needs you to be in a small group. Here's, the, here's what's going to happen at the, at the decision time, and it's right now. Take one of these Connect cards, put your name on it, and maybe write, I need to be in a small group. Help, Robert, help me, hook me up with a small group. Somebody who's going to hold me accountable. Somebody who I can hold accountable. Someone who I need to know what, they, what they're praying about, what they're struggling with, what they're dealing with. What are their joys? Let's pray.